All right, good afternoon and welcome to the 16th installment of our Acadiana Business Resource webinar series. My name is Andre Bro, and I work on the team at One Acadiana. In March 2020, One Acadiana joined with other business resource partners from across the Acadiana region um, to support our business community, particularly our small businesses, in response to COVID-19 by hosting a series of webinars on timely and relevant topics. Topics ranged from federal aid programs to COVID-19 impacts on specific industries to business re reopening and recovery uh, and more. Today's topic picks up where we left off with a presentation by the PCAR group on the end of year pandemic relief passed by Congress and its impact on business. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A, so please enter your questions in the Q&A feature as we go, and we will get to as many questions as we can. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to one Acadiana's president and CEO, Troy Wayman, for some opening remarks. Thank you, Andre, uh, and thank you all for joining us today. When we first started this webinar series, I don't think we ever expected to hit number 16. Uh, we were just discussing uh, before we opened the went live with the webinar the fact that the first one of these that we did with the PCARD group was uh, uh, 11 months ago, and that really seems amazing to us. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, uh, to have partners like the PCARD group. Uh, they are an amazing in, uh, investor and partner of ours and, and uh, work with us on a number of things. Uh, we uh, at One Acadiana, we are the local chamber of commerce for Lafayette, but we also serve as a nine parish economic development organization. Uh, and we partnered with our uh, local economic developers across the nine parish region, as well as the chambers of commerce and have strong partners in them as well. So uh, with that, in the interest of time, I'm going to turn things over to our partners at the PCARD group. And I'll introduce to you the leader, the fearless leader of the PCARD group, <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Tyron Picard. Hey, thank you, Troy. Uh, did you say fearful or fearless? <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, well, I guess we should leave that up for debate right now. <laughs> so, but thank you and thank Andre. Uh, it's always our pleasure to partner uh, with one of Katie who does such uh, a wonderful job uh, being a, a, a change agent for economic development in Acadiana and, um, and as well as sustaining and helping to grow our existing businesses. So. Uh, we're very honored to, uh, to be a part of it today. Well, I'm Tyron Picard, the uh, principal and founder of the Picard Group. Uh, we are a 13-person state and federal governmental affairs group um, in Washington and, and Louisiana with offices in Lafayette, Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, uh, and of course, Washington, D.C. And uh, honored today to uh, have two of our uh, team members from our federal team in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, Emily Bakke um, is a former uh, legislative staffer for uh, longtime United States Senator John Bro, uh, and um, has been with the firm for, uh, for 10 years. And Hunter Hall. Uh, Hunter is a former uh, congressional staffer with U.S. Senator Bill Cassidy. And prior to joining the PCARD group, uh, was an appointee to the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce, um, where he um, spent, served for, uh, for some time. So um, we're appreciative to have both of them who have been um, very, very close to a lot of the uh, COVID relief that's been fashioned uh, and uh, ha have been working with a number of staff members uh, through that process. So uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Emily, who I think is going to sort of take the, uh, the first piece of, of, of going through uh, the legislation um, that passed right at the end of last year. Thank you, Tyron. Next slide. Thank you. So um, as Tyron mentioned, you know, at the end of the year, uh, actually the end of December, uh, Congress finally passed the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. It was a very large bill. It totaled $2 trillion. It wasn't just COVID relief. There were a number of uh, provisions included in it, including the annual appropriations. Um, and so that's why it was so large. Um, this took months to, to put together. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, 
state and locals were, were pushing for additional relief, small businesses were as well, in the summer and they couldn't, uh, Congress could not reach an agreement um, until the end of the year. Um, I'll mention a few kind of high level provisions that are included and then there are some that we will get uh, more in depth uh, on later on in our presentation. But first of all, there was 325 billion included for the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, they also made some improvements to it, including an ability for a second draw. Um, and there's also funding assistance for shuttered live venues. There's also an unemployment benefits extension. It extends all pandemic unemployment programs by 11 weeks and the federal supplemental unemployment insurance benefits by $300 per week from December 26th of 2020 through March 14th of 2021. Direct payments to individuals was also included. So um, if you make $75,000 and below, you received um, a direct deposit of $600. Um, there's also an employer credit for paid sick and family leave. Uh, this is for employers to continue voluntarily offering paid sick and family leave to their employees. We'll get um, a little bit more into detail with that later on. And then just overall, there was a lot of additional funding uh, included for COVID relief. As far as healthcare, there was another $3 billion included for the Provider Relief Fund. In terms of vaccine distribution, there was $8.75 billion for vaccine development and distribution. And of this, $4.5 billion is available from the CDC for grants to states and local governments. Another kind of funding pot for local governments was an emergency rental assistance program that was created. It's $25 billion um, going directly from the Treasury to local governments that have 200,000 uh, population and above. There's also quite a bit of transportation funding. 45 billion was included for airports, airlines, local transit agencies, and then state departments of transportation. About 54 billion was included for elementary and secondary education. And then I would just note one thing that was not included and that's direct funding for state and locals. This was something that, um, you know, the National Association of Counties, um, you know, the, the states, um, the mayors, everyone was pushing for this. And, and honestly, Senator Cassidy was a huge proponent of additional funding for state and locals. And he, in fact, introduced bipartisan legislation in the summer to really push this. I would say that that was one of the big stumbling blocks and why it took so long to get this bill passed was, um, you know, that there was just a real push to have this included. Ultimately, it was dropped out um, of the package. Now, this is something that uh, the incoming Biden administration will be pushing, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, no additional funding for state and locals. I'll now turn it over to Hunter, who will begin to talk about the, the changes to the Paycheck Protection Program. Thank you, Emily. So for small businesses, one of the most important sections of the uh, newest emergency release pa relief package is called the Economic Aid to Hard Hit Small Businesses, Nonprofits, and Venues Act, also referred to as the Economic Aid Act and the EAA. The EAA provides funding for a second round of forgivable loans through the PPP for small businesses and nonprofits and makes programmatic, programmatic improvements to PPP. The focus is the same. These are designed to provide a direct incentive for small businesses to keep their workers on the payroll. Um, the EAA section also covers grants to sh for shuttered venues and the emergency enhancements to the SBA lending programs, which Emily will discuss later on. Before we get started, there are now two types of PPP loans, the first draw and the second draw loans. To avoid any confusion, your first draw loan is your initial loan, whether you received a PP lien, a PP, uh, pr paycheck protection loan already, or uh, if you will apply for your first loan um, during this period. The second draw loan was created by this legislation, the EAA, and that's your second bite at the apple. Um, that's a, a second loan um, with similar terms and such to the first. Uh, they do limit eligibility, which we will get into shortly. Um, so for the first draw PPP loans, um, as many of you know or have experienced, uh, these are, are used to help fund payroll costs, uh, including benefits. It can also be used to help pay for mortgage interest, rent, utilities, worker protection costs related to COVID-19, uninsured property damage costs, 
caused by looting and vandalism during 2020 and certain supplier costs and expenses for operations. Similar to the PPP loans for last spring, uh, one, there is a 100% SBA guarantee, no collateral, collateral requirement, no personal guarantee requirement, uh, a non-compounding, non-adjustable interest rate of 1% on a five-year maturity. Um, there are similar borrower eligibility and certification requirements and similar processing requirements for lenders administering the second draw PPP. Uh, borrowers of the first draw will be eligible for loan forgiveness if the following criteria were met during the covered period, um, uh, including if employee numbers and compensation levels were maintained, uh, and 60% of the proceeds had to have been spent on payroll costs, and the, with the remainder of the proceeds only being used towards eligible expenses. The application period for the first draw loans uh, will run January 11th to March 31st. 2021. Um, now for the second draw loans, uh, the additional round of PP fund, PPP funds um, known as the second draw loans are limited to certain businesses that have either already uh, or that have already received a first draw PPP loan that have 300 employees or less and experienced at least a 25% reduction in gross receipts between comparable quarters in 2019 and 2020. One thing to note, borrowers who previously received a PPP loan but have not used the full amount can still apply for a second draw PPP. However, SBA will not disperse the second draw funds until the funds from the first draw have been fully utilized. The application period for the second draw loan it will run January 13th to March 31st. Hopefully, the second draw PPP loans are subject to the same terms as the original PPP as the first draw, um, the, uh, which I listed earlier. The maximum loan amount for most borrow borrowers will remain at two and a half times average monthly payroll costs for 2019 or 2020. Um, something new for the second draw loans a borrower can um, calculate their loan amount based on payroll costs from 2019 and 2020. Uh, for the second draw loans, though, you can also use the actual trailing 12-month period before the application. This is going to benefit borrowers whose payrolls declined during the pandemic. Uh, your CPA will best explain the trailing 12-month period option and if that option is best for you. Uh, there is an exception to the two and a half time average monthly uh, payroll costs for borrowers in the accommodation and food services sector. So the U.S. Census Bureau's classification system, the NAICS, sector 72, uh, defines, is defined as businesses whose activities are providing customers with lodging and preparing meals, snacks, and beverages for immediate consumption. So most hotels and most standalone restaurants. Um, a final note about second draw loans, um, or a note about second draw loans, borrowers will be eligible to apply for loan forgiveness after the full utilization of the second draw funds. Uh, the requirements for, for loan forgiveness will run identical to the first draw loans, including the need to maintain employee and compensation levels uh, at their previous uh, level. Um, some additional notes, if the loan is less than $150,000, you will not be required to demonstrate that 25% revenue, revenue decline at the time of the application. However, ultimately, uh, you will need to demonstrate that decline in order to obtain forgiveness. Um, the second draw loan will not be immediately available for some borrowers deemed uh, unresolved borrowers of PPP. That is a business or an individual whose first loan is being reviewed by SBA. Uh, they will not be able to be eligible to receive the second draw loan until their issues uh, regarding the first loan are resolved. Um, and the SBA will work with the lender when an applicant is considered an unresolved borrower. For those going through that unresolved issue right now, the SBA will set aside your funds uh, in the event that you are approved. That way you don't lose your place in line. Um, 
There's some additional rules around gross receipts of borrowers uh, who've engaged in an acquisition or disposition during 2019 or 2020. Those are very detailed and should be discussed with the tax professional uh, specific to your company. Um, additionally, Congress expanded the list of ineligible borrowers for the second draw to include businesses receiving a shuttered venue grant. They uh, are trying to prevent double dipping. Any entity in which a certain federal official holds more than 20% by vote or value of any class of equity. Uh, this is in response to some members of Congress whose, whose spouses um, apply for and receive significant PPP loans. Um, another ineligible borrower would be one currently in a bankruptcy proceeding. And then finally, uh, ineligible borrowers include public companies, which are defined as issuers with securities listed on a national securities exchange. Now, on the public companies piece, there's some ambiguity around the subsidiary of a publicly traded company. Based on the loan necessity questionnaire, it appears that subsidiaries of public companies may be eligible for PPP and second draw loans. We are awaiting additional guidance and I would work with your tax professional or tax attorney as that additional guidance is released and things are ironed out. As I stated earlier, there were a number of programmatic improvements to the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, Congress did this to avoid some of the hiccups that were the cause of so much, uh, so much heartburn and so many headaches uh, back in the second quarter of 2020. These improvements include um, new eligibility for certain 501c6 nonprofits and destination marketing organizations with 300 or fewer employees. Uh, also included are local newspapers, and television, and radio stations, which were previously ineligible because of their affiliation with other stations. Um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act modifies the CARES Act, overrides IRS and Treasury Department determination, and provides for businesses um, that businesses are now eligible to deduct expenses funded with PPP loan proceeds. So if you have a million dollar PPP loan, uh, you could look at uh, up to $300,000 um, um, back on your taxes there. Uh, the EEA, the EAA expands a borrower's PPP payroll costs to include items such as group insurance benefits, uh, group insurance benefit payments, as well as some other measures. Uh, this also includes, uh, expands the allowable and forgivable expenses, uh, for the PPP for brevity's sake. I won't highlight the entire list here. Um, banks don't fret. Congress included protections for PPP lenders as well, uh, with assurances that no enforcement action could be taken against the lender who originated the loan in good faith, complied with all regulations, and relied in good faith on a borrower's certification and documentation. Uh, as stated earlier, the forgiveness process for smaller loans up to 150 has been streamlined, but they, this, uh, this bill also increases SBA's ability to audit and review the forgiven loans. Um, one last note on FAQs and guidance. While SBA and Treasury have released preliminary rules around the new programs, they have not yet updated their existing FAQs to conform to this Economic Aid Act. Um, they have noted they intend to do so as quickly as feasible. Uh, until then, anything noted in EAA will override any conflicting guidance in previously posted FAQs. Um, I'll now turn it over to Emily, who's going to discuss the other provisions from the Economic Aid Act. Thanks, Hunter. So as we mentioned before, there is a new grant program. So not a loan program, but a grant program that was authorized. Um, it totals $15 billion and it's um, for eligible live venue operators or promoters, uh, theatrical producers, live performing arts organization operators, museum operators, zoos, aquariums, um, and so you just have to demonstrate at least a 25% reduction in revenues. Um, you must have been fully operational as of February 29th, 2020. And as of the date of receiving the grant, um, you have to either have resumed or intend to resume organizing, promoting, managing, or hosting future events. Um, there is a, uh, a $2 billion set aside for eligible entities. 
um, that employ not more than 50 full-time employees and any amounts from this set aside remaining after 60 days from the date of implementation shall become available to all el eligible applicants under this section. Um, the SBA may make an initial grant of up to $10 million to an eligible person or entity and a supplemental grant that is equal to 50% of the initial grant. Um, in the initial 14 day period of implementation of the program, and I believe we are at the kind of the very end of that first 14 days, um, grants are only to be awarded to eligible entities that have faced 90% or greater revenue loss. And the 14 day period following the initial 14 day period, grants can only be awarded to eligible entities that have faced 70% or greater revenue loss. So it's after those first two periods, grants can then be awarded to all other eligible entities. And grants can be used for specific expenses such as payroll costs, rent, utilities, and personal protective equipment. Now, as far as emergency enhancements and improvements, you know, there are other SBA lending programs. You know, I think PPP um, gets a lot of notoriety because it was brand new and it was created to deal with, um, you know, the coronavirus impacts. But certainly there are kind of the SBA bread and butter programs um, that may be a better fit for some small businesses. And so there were some modifications made to 7A loan programs in the end of year relief package. It increases to 90% the loan guarantee amounts on 7A loans including for community advantage loans until October 1st, 2021. The legislation also increases the express loan amount from 350,000 to 1 million on January 1, 2021, and then reverts permanently to a lower amount of 500,000 on October 1st, 2021. The express loan guarantee amounts for loans of 350,000 and less is temporarily increased from 50% to 75%. And for loans above 350,000, the guarantee remains at 50%. And then on October 1st of this year, the guarantee reverts to 50% for all express loans. Also, the legislation waives lender and borrower fee that fees for both the 7A and 504 loan programs. So we just wanted to make note of that. Again, PPP may not be the best fit for everyone, but you may wanna look at some of the other, these other SBA programs. Next slide, please. One of the things we also wanted to touch on um, are some of the employer tax credits. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on the paid leave credit. Um, employers are not required to provide paid sick leave or paid family leave for coronavirus related reasons under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act after December 31st, 2020. But the COVID relief bill allows employers with less than 500 employees to voluntarily provide this leave and take the tax credit associated with the leave through March 31st of this year. Tax credits are available for qualifying wages paid while an employee is on leave if one, the leave would have been required under the Families First uh, Coronavirus uh, Response Act had it been extended through March 21st, 2021 and all requirements related to leave under the FFCRA are met. The bill does not change the maximum amount of paid leave subject to the tax credit for an individual employee. So this means that if an employee took 80 hours of paid sick leave to quarantine in 2020 and the employer claimed the tax credit on wages paid during that leave, the employer cannot claim an additional tax credit on wages paid to that same employee for additional paid sick leave in 2021. Another note that we, we wanted to make sure you were aware of, um, this legislation also extended the employer credit for paid and medical leave through 2025. So this tax credit was um, passed originally as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in December of 2017. So it was intended to help businesses reduce their taxes while an employee is on paid leave from his or her job duties due to specified reasons. Um, you know, if an employer pays the qualifying employees at least 50% of their salary while on family and medical leave for up to 12 weeks in a year, you can claim this credit. So again, that's now extended through 2025. 
Um, I will now turn it over to Hunter, who's going to touch on a few of the disaster area author authorizing provisions that were included in the legislation. Thank you, Emily. So the stimulus legislation included disaster tax relief for indiv individuals and businesses in areas that receive a presidential di disaster declaration uh, on or after January 1st, 2020, until 60 days after the date of enactment. The bill was enacted on December 27, 2020, so roughly February 24th of this year. Um, the first thing I'd like to touch on is the employee retention credit for disaster zones. Uh, this is similar to the employee retention credit provided by the, Fair, the CARES Act, which I'll talk about that and some changes shortly, but this differs in several significant ways. For those of you that, has, that have participated in a disaster-related employee retention cre uh, credit uh, enacted for previous specific disasters, this is identical to those previous programs. Um, this employee retention tax credit for disaster zones provides a tax credit of 40% of wages to employers in those disaster zones, up to $6,000 in wages per employee, which results in a maximum credit of about $2,400 per employee. Uh, differing from the regular employee retention credit, the disaster relief version of this credit applies to wages paid without regard to whether services associated with those wages were performed. An eligible employer for this credit is any employer located in that qualifying disaster zone um, that had re has retained employees during a recovery period despite becoming inoperable and has continued to pay employees unable to perform services during a qualified disaster or relocated those employees to other locations to resume their work. So if you operated an active trade or business in a qualifying disaster zone and were inoperable at any time during that period, beginning the first day of the disaster and ending upon enactment of, of this legislation, you can qualify for that disaster tax credit. The next piece I'll talk about related to disasters is the use of retirement funds for disaster mitigation. The Consolidated Appropriations Act provides several types of relief to individuals uh, in the same disasters we just highlighted. In particular, there are special rules provided for early withdrawals from retirement accounts and their repayment. The use of retirement funds for disaster mitigation would allow residents of disaster areas to borrow uh, or take out a loan of up to $100,000 from a retirement plan or IRA um, without penalty. Any income attributable to an early distribution in these circumstances will be subjected will be subject to tax over a three-year period. To avoid the tax on that income, taxpayers will be allowed to recontribute the distributed funds to an eligible retirement plan within three years. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is the employee retention tax credit the, for, for those not located in the qualifying disaster area. Um, this was uh, provided by the CARES Act that was signed back in March. Uh, this credit was set to end on um, December 31st of 2020. It has now been extended for a six-month period to June 30th, 2021. And they expanded the eligibility uh, by increasing the credit rate from 50% to 70% of qualified wages. They expanded the eligibility for the credit by reducing the required year-over-year -year gross receipts decline from 50% to 20%. Uh, also provides a safe harbor allowing employers to use prior quarter gross receipts to determine eligibility. The limit on per employee creditable wages will increase from $10,000 for the year to $10,000 for each quarter, uh, a significant increase. Um, again, rather than $10,000 for the year as it was previously, it will now be $10,000 per employee credible wages uh, for each quarter. For the purpose of determining the relevant qualified wages, the definition of a large employer will increase from 100 or more employees to employers with more than 500 employees. Um, this also expands the employee retention credit eligibility to public colleges and universities, as well as government entities with a principal purpose or function of providing medical or hospital care. Um, and finally, uh, provides rules to allow new employers that were not in existence for all or part of 2019 to be able to claim the credit. Some retroactive provisions uh, regarding the employers that receive PPP loans 
um, they will still qualify for ERC with, for the employee retention credit with respect to wages that are not paid for with forgiven PPP proceeds. Also, group health plan expenses can be considered qualifying wages, even when no other wages are paid to the employee. Um, and it, one thing I'd like to note as we look towards the next Congress and the new administration, which Emily is gonna, gonna uh, speak about here in a moment, please don't be surprised if FAQs and guidance create significant changes. We also expect additional provisions and then revisions and corrections on these provisions when a new COVID relief package is passed in the near future. I'm gonna throw it back over to Emily Bakke de Silva uh, to discuss the 117th Congress and uh, some of the impacts on the Senate changes and the potential for additional COVID-19 relief. Emily? Hey, Senator. So, you know, first up, impacts of Senate changes. Um, you know, both the House and Senate convened on January 3rd, and at that time, we didn't even know uh, which party would be controlling the Senate. And if you were to have asked Hunter uh, and me about that, we would have said Republicans will retain control. There's no way that Democrats can flip both seats in Georgia. Of course, Tyron will say that uh, he felt like he knew that there was a chance, uh, so he wasn't as shocked. But I will tell you, um, you know, lots of people woke up on, on January 6th and were floored that um, there was going to be a 50-50 Senate. So, you know, what does it really mean when it's 50-50? Of course, um, the president's party controls uh, the floor or controls the majority simply because the vice president becomes the, the tie-breaking vote. Um, actually, leaders McConnell and Schumer are meeting this afternoon to try and work out what that power sharing deal will look like. It will likely mean that um, ratios will be equal. It will be 50-50 in terms of members sitting on committees and staff on committees as well. I think, you know, the big thing to think about is that Democrats will now control the Senate calendar. And so they will control what legislation actually goes to the floor. Um, it also will help President-elect Biden in terms of getting his cabinet picks, uh, you know, confirmed quickly. Because for um, cabinet uh, nominations, you only need uh, majority plus one. You don't need uh, 60. And so, you know, I think that was a big game changer for the incoming Biden administration. They should get most of their picks um, confirmed uh, fairly quickly. Of course, as far as legislation, you still need 60 votes to have overcome a filibuster. Um, all legislation will still face a 60 vote threshold to invoke cloture and break a legislative filibuster, meaning you need at least 10 Republicans who would have to side with Democrats to move legislation. I think what that means, honestly, is that moderates hold a whole lot of power. So I'm sure you've heard these names before. Joe Manchin of West Virginia, Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. Um, those are the moderates who are willing to cross um, party lines and make deals. You know, even Senator Cassidy um, was a part of this uh, deal making group um, at the end of the year with the COVID relief package. And so, you know, I think if we're going to see kind of big legislation, look to see where those moderates are. Um, you know, of course, you probably have heard about budget reconciliation. And this is a tool that Democrats will have um, as an opportunity to achieve some of their major legislative goals. Um, you can make changes to tax laws or to spending to meet targets set by congressional budget resolution. And again, it's you only need a majority, uh, 50 plus one. The budget reconciliation process has been invoked numerous times by presidents to achieve large legislative priorities. Notably, it was used to pass both the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, by President Trump at the end of 2017. And President Obama used it to pass the Affordable Care Act. Again, you have kind of small bites at the apple to, to try and, and get legislation through with those budget parameters. Uh, but of course, the incoming Biden administration and um, the House and Senate are already talking about how they may use budget reconciliation. And I think first off is additional COVID-19 relief. If they're seeing that they can't move something in a bipartisan fashion, um, you know, they may try and push something through uh, by using budget reconciliation. Uh, President-elect Biden released his, his uh, American Rescue Plan last week. And it's a wish list, so take it with a grain of salt. It totals $1.9 trillion, um, but you can see kind of the, the guidelines of where they would like to go. $20 billion for a national vac vaccination plan, 
350 billion for state and local governments. Again, this direct funding was missing in the last package and local governments have really been pushing for this. Also uh, an additional $1,400 for individuals. When you add that into the $600 from December, it ends up totaling $2,000, which I'm sure you've heard about. There's also talk of raising the federal minimum wage to $15. You know, I, I know that makes you know some folks nervous. I would just say, I think that's gonna be difficult to do in this environment because, because of the budget reconciliation rules, you can't necessarily pass a, um, a minimum wage increase through budget reconciliation. You would need 60 votes for that one. There's also talk of extending current unemployment and an additional $400 supplement through September. There's also talk of more grants um, to the hardest hit small businesses and lever leveraging 175 billion in additional small business lending and investment. And then there's also talk of 14 weeks of paid sick and family leave. So those are a few of the ideas. Again, it's, it's just a proposal. We haven't even seen legislative text. That will need to come from both the House and the Senate. But I do think that will be you know, the top legislative priority once that the Senate gets through nominees, potentially an impeachment trial, they would then turn to this. And then disaster relief legislation. You know, um, we do we do expect that there will will be some additional disaster relief legislation. Usually after disasters, we will see FEMA make an official request to Congress to deal with fires, floods, hurricanes. But FEMA did not do that in 2020. Um, and one of the reasons they didn't do it is because their coffers were so full from um, funding that Congress had provided related to COVID relief. So FEMA didn't need to come and ask for additional funding. We expect a request to come probably in early spring. And of course, um, you know, once we see that, that would certainly impact Southwest Louisiana, particularly the Lake Charles area, you know, with the, the two hurricanes that hit there this past fall. And then in terms of kind of other legislative priorities, once you get through kind of this first COVID-19 relief package, President-elect Biden has already said um, he expects to roll out a recovery plan shortly around the time he um, addresses the joint session of Congress, which will likely be in February. And this kind of recovery plan we've heard will likely include some sort of infrastructure package. Again, this is something that could be bipartisan um, and that could move relatively quickly. So that's what we're hearing so far. I know we've kind of thrown a lot at you, um, but that concludes our presentation and I'll turn it back to uh, Andre for, uh, to start facilitating the Q&A. Thank you, Emily and Hunter. Um, at this point, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. So please um, enter your questions into the Q&A feature. Um, and we're gonna get to as many questions as we can. I know we've already had a few that were submitted. Uh, Tyron Picard is gonna facilitate the Q&A portion. So I'll hand it back off to Tyron. Thank you, Andre. Uh, while we're waiting for a couple of those to, uh, to come in, let me throw one question to uh, Hunter and Emily. Um, talk about the, um, uh, let, let's boil down the, the, the changes in party uh, in control uh, and, and shuffling in the House and Senate uh, and what that means for the Louisiana delegation and the Louisiana members of Congress, uh, if you would. Sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at it and then Hunter, feel free to, to throw in any ideas. Um, you know, of course with the Senate, I, you know, with a 50-50 Senate, our senators still wield a whole lot of power. Um, I think, you know, I think of Senator Kennedy in particular, who's on the Appropriations Committee, um, had Republicans retain control. He was expected to chair the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee, which of course funds the Army Corps of Engineers, which is, you know, so crucial to so many things um, in Louisiana. Uh, he will now be the ranking member. He still will hold a whole lot of sway. And so, um, you know, I think for Louisiana, we're still in a great position. You look at Senator Cassidy, who's on, you know, the Finance Committee and the Help Committee. So any of these big, you know, COVID relief packages will certainly be going through those committees. Again, with a 50-50 a split, you have um, just as much power in the committee. So, you know, as, as far as the Senate side, um, again, they won't be in charge of 
kind of deciding the calendar and what bills go to the floor. But I think in terms of drafting legislation, they will still be very key and Louisiana will still hold a whole bunch of power. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. And we'll get to uh, just a couple of questions. The, uh, and uh, Emily, I'll tell you that the, uh, it's not that I had a crystal ball about Georgia. It was uh, simply that on the Friday before the election, I called a friend of mine who's a national Republican pollster. And he said, I think the Republicans are down about two points. And that afternoon, I called a friend of mine who's a Democratic national pollster. And he said, I think the Democrats are down about two points. So it gave me a pretty good idea that it was gonna be a close race, but um, I'm seeing an overriding theme coming in about on the questions about EDIL, EIDL grants and PPP. One of the things we definitely wanna leave you with here today is that uh, there is no cookie cutter answer uh, for all businesses. It is very, very important that you take this information uh, if you believe that you qualify uh, to your uh, CPA, your bookkeeper, uh, who will likely uh, be able to give you uh, guidance as to whether your particular um, situation of your business and your financial situation qualifies in these, in these buckets. Um, one question that came <laughs> in, I'm sorry, Hunter. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. One question that I came in that came in was, what if you're a new business that is that has just started, um, and, and say in the last uh, four months, will PVP help you if you're just starting your business and need help getting supplies and equipment? No, for PPP, you had to have been uh, in operation, um, and there's so many dates we've looked at, uh, but I believe it is sometime around January 27th or February 15th of 2020. Um, so it, ca it cannot be uh, a brand new business that was created during the pandemic. But I would add that um, this business may want to look at some of the other SBA programs that are out right. there that have been tweaked yeah. that may be a better fit. Which is why going to your yeah. CPA is, is probably really good advice. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the shuttered venue grants. Um, do you have to have at least 50 employees is, is what was one question. Uh, another question was, well, we met all the different uh, criteria, except we don't own the uh, public address system, lighting and mixing equipment. We rent that. Do we, will we qualify uh, if, we, if we simply rent that? Uh, um, I think you should qualify when you're just renting that, but we certainly can look into that a little bit more. Again, um, they have not put out FAQs yet. I think those are coming. And so that may give us a little bit more detail. Um, so I think you, you would be eligible. Um, on the 50 uh, employee threshold, um, I believe you can have fewer than 50 employees. Okay. Um, a couple of questions have come in uh, regarding the uh, EIDL uh, grants. Where would be the best place to go for uh, more information on the uh, EIDL uh, advance? So the SBA.gov does have um, a very good uh, layout of their different programs and options available to businesses. I will add, I see a question in there related to the advance. They did um, adjust uh, some of the criteria to the eligibility, eligibility requirements for the new EIDL grants. The new requirements, um, they lowered the employee threshold from 500 down to 300. Um, and the other two new requirements, the entity must be located in a low income community and it has to have suffered an economic loss of greater than 30%. Um, there, it was also a provision about the um, $10,000 advance. Um, uh, that does not need to be repaid. Uh, they will do not need to be deducted, no longer need to be deducted from your PPP loan uh, amount. So that $10,000 is, is completely, um, if you are eligible to receive it, is completely free. And Tyron, let me add something on that question um, 
regarding the event um, for uh, renting uh, the lighting and, and public address system and others, I think it was to benefit a 501c6. I would just say that 501c6 may want to look into the PPP program because they are now eligible, eligible. for PPP. And That's they right. weren't previously. And staying on the shuttered venue operators um, uh, part, uh, if the venue was shuttered due to COVID, um, you know, decline in business due to COVID and did not, and so they, they currently don't have any employees, would they still qualify? They don't have any employees because it was shuttered. Yes, they, cur yes, they, they should still qualify. Okay. Because they expect to bring back their employees when they, when they reopen. Okay. Um, one other question was regarding um, someone who's in the transportation business. Uh, very small operation, uh, the owner, one employee, um, they're an LLC. Uh, what funding would be available to them? So they are eligible for the, uh, for the PPP program as a sole propri proprietor. Um, uh, so obviously, uh, you won't have any employees. You're reporting your payroll costs uh, for the PP for your for the PPP loan. You're reporting your net business income, which is reported on your Schedule C. Um, as long as your business was operational prior to February 15th of 2020, uh, you are still eligible. Um, but you will the I'll, I'll find the exact language that they use. But you are eligible, and it's based off your net uh, business income on your Schedule C. And most of the areas in, uh, most of the uh, uh, participants probably on this call and, and, and in the one Acadiana service area uh, were in declared uh, disaster zone, zone. So let's shift to that for just one second. That employee retention tax credit. So if I own, uh, if I own a, a, um, a business that, uh, was in uh, Jeff Davis Parish uh, or, or, or uh, Calpishu Parish uh, with 100 employees um, and uh, was in operation um, in, in 2020 prior to the, to the storm, uh, the two hurricanes that came through, uh, I'll, I would be eligible for uh, a credit of up to up to six thousand dollars for each of those hundred one hundred employees. Six thousand dollars in 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 wages are eligible. So the maximum credit per employee is twenty four hundred dollars per employee. But yes, you would be eligible okay, so for that. Okay, so it's forty. So it's forty percent. Forty. It's forty percent of uh, of their wages. Uh, Right, and so it'd be up to twenty four hundred. Right. So it'd be twenty four hundred dollars times the hundred one hundred employees, which is a significant amount of money. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, I saw a question in here about Idle. Just to finish off the Idle, uh, have they opened the Idle Advance for people to apply yet? So uh, until they they finalize more of the uh, provide more guidance and, and finalize the FAQs, uh, they they haven't. Um, they have not opened the application process um, with the new standards yet. And once again, on the uh, Hunter, one more follow up on that employee retention. We're not talking about it being a deduction. It's an actual tax credit, right? Correct. Correct. Right. So it, it is an actual uh, credit. So it's much more significant. Uh, the um, as well as the, the uh, low income housing tax credits in, in the impacted or disaster areas, which I'm fairly certain most everything south of I-10 between Lafayette Lake Charles was in the declared uh, uh, zone uh, after uh, one of the two hurricanes. Uh, so it, it um, are there any, um, are there any other significant target dates for qualifying for either the employee retention credit or the low income housing tax credit um, that uh, people should be aware of. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, it was breaking up a little so bit. Are, they, are there any 
significant dates in terms of uh, uh, as to yeah. when someone would qualify. Uh, obviously, we know the dates of the storms, yeah. but if they were in business on such and such a date, I'm assuming that would mean prior to the declaration of the disaster, if, if their business was in right. operation, they'll qualify. And, and Correct. The, if their business, the business was in operation. And the business is domiciled in the parish in which the disaster was declared. Correct. Or even the employees that are working in that um, de declared parish. Oh, okay. Very good. Okay. And, and I want to correct myself earlier. They did turn the COVID-19 idle loans back on. If you go to the, uh, the, the SBA.gov website, uh, they do have the application open the idle advance. It is saying is no longer available. Um, um, yeah, but the application is open. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. Hunter, you and Emily talked about uh, the fact that state and local um, relief was was left out of, of this package due to the fact that it was right at the end of the year and they were running out of time to get something done. Uh, have, have you all seen a, um, I, I guess, a, a willingness or a priority uh, amongst uh, both Democrats and Republicans to make sure that that does get included in the next package? It, it, I mean, President-elect Biden has already said it is a top priority for him. Um, we know that it is for, for House Democrats and can only assume it is for Senate Democrats. Um, and there were a number of Senate Republicans, again, like Senator Cassidy, who were very supportive of this. Um, you know, from what Hunter and I were actually just hearing a little bit before this webinar started, it sounded like um, Democrats may use reconciliation, this tool that we were talking about where you only need 50 plus one um, to get it through the Senate, that they may use this tool for this first COVID relief package. If that's the case, then I do believe we will see direct assistance for state and locals, no question. So it took nine months for, for us to get the second COVID relief package from the, uh, from the passage of the first one in March. What's your esti estimate on a timeline as to when this next one will come about? I, 30 days, 60 days? Yeah, it's, I'll it's, take it's Oh, go ahead, Hunter. I was going to say it's projected. They're looking at, you know, Chuck Schumer said today, uh, the incoming Senate Majority Leader, um, that they have three priorities that they would like to do quickly: impeachment, nominations, and COVID relief. Um, the COVID relief package, which they do want to use uh, as of now, the reconciliation process. Uh, they're looking at late February to early March. Um, that timeline could change based on how other priorities are handled, like nominations um, and the impeachment process. Uh, but as of now, I think they have, have circled the last week of February, first week of March, as when they would pass new COVID relief. And, you know, that could slip. My, my sense is we may not see something till maybe April. Um, or late March, but yeah, I think they're, because reconciliation can take some time, particularly on the Senate side where you can have a kind of voterama and that can go on and on. Um, but yeah, I think spring. In, a, uh, in addition to the disaster um, relief and the, uh, the next round of the COVID relief, Talk briefly, if you would, uh, there were a couple of um, funding extender authorizations, which basically uh, uh, put in uh, to, uh, are funded for an additional five years, a couple of different programs. Uh, could you touch on maybe just a, a couple of those that would be of significance? New market tax credits. Yeah, there, there were a number of, um tax credits that were extended and, and those tax credits were originally part of um, that uh, Trump tax cuts in 2017. Yeah. Um, There's sorry. a 100% deduction for certain business meals. Um, there's an election to waive farming loss carrybacks. Um, 
There is an employer-sponsored uh, uh, student loan repayment tax credit uh, that is available. Um, and get a couple more details on that. And the family leave credit, which we had mentioned. The right. family, yes. Right. Um, one question we had that just came in, um, the, uh, if an entity uh, that is operating in uh, the affected disaster relief area is owned by uh, a private equity firm, would that uh, impact their eligibility to, the, uh, uh, to be eligible for, the, um, for the, uh, either the, uh, low, uh, the um, low income housing tax credit or the employee retention credit? My hunch would be no, uh, but that, because it's, it's based upon businesses located there, not based upon the ownership structure of, of the business. Is that correct? You're correct. Um, yeah, some of the other uh, tax extended provisions, the work opportunity tax credit, uh, employers that hire individuals from certain targeted groups, that was supposed to expire on the 31st, was extended to uh, December 31st, 2025. Uh, the new market tax credits, the incentive program that provides federal tax credits uh, in exchange for investments in low income communities, uh, that was extended to 2025. The excise taxes on beer and, and wine and, uh, and distillers was made permanent. It lowered the excise tax uh, that was implemented as part of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. That was supposed to expire December 31st. Um, there's a one-year extension of uh, credits and deductions, uh, including depreciation rules that were set to expire on December 31st, 2020. Those have been extended for one year. The Indian Employment Credit accelerated depreciation for business property on Indian reservations, three-year recovery period for racehorses, income tax and excise tax credits to biofuel producers, fuel cell motor vehicles, and several others. Um, but those were the provisions that were extended for, uh, for five years, the biggest one being the work opportunity and the new market tax credit. New markets, right. Well, I see that we're uh, approaching uh, 2.30 here. And uh, Andre, uh, I don't know if, if, um, if that uh, gets us close to our, our end today or if, if you all have any other questions. Yeah, we're right at time. Uh, the two other things I've seen come through, if y'all wanna touch on them real quick. Um, one, Ben asked if y'all could just restate the information on the use of retirement funds for disaster mitigation and how they can be spread out um, over multiple years. Um, I think Emily, you touched on that a little bit earlier. And then there was a question about um, lost rent and landlords and if they can use the idle for lost rent. Um, so if, if we have yeah. just a couple of minutes, if y'all can touch on those and we'll, then we'll close out. I'll touch on the retirement funds for disaster mitigation. The, C, uh, the, the Coronavirus uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act provided several types of relief to individuals in those disaster areas um, extended beyond the businesses. In particular, there was one rule for early withdrawals from retirement accounts. Um, the use of retirement funds for disaster mitigation uh, will allow residents in those disaster areas to borrow or take out a loan of up to $100,000 from a retirement plan or IRA without penalty. Any income attributable to this early distribution in these circumstances will be subject to a tax, um, to tax over a three year period. Uh, to avoid paying the tax on that income, taxpayers will be allowed to recontribute the distributed funds to an eligible retirement plan within three years. So you could either pay the, uh, the tax over a three year period or recontribute the funds over a three-year period to avoid the taxes. And as, as far as the idle question and whether or not a landlord may be eligible, um, I think, yes, you may be eligible, but um, I think it may depend on um, how you've organized your rental business to take in the rental income. Uh, again, you could probably talk to, um, you know, a, 
a lender about that or um, you know, a, a CPA and that they could help you there. And I think that's a great place to end. So we got into a lot of detailed questions today and we really appreciate the expertise of the PCAR group and our partnership with them to bring all of this information to you all into our business community. And um, obviously it's, the legislation is complex. There's a lot of components to it and there's gonna be a lot that's particular to your individual business. Um, so please do reach out to your lender as you work through this. Um, and talk through those specific questions to your business because they're really going to be able to help you get into some of those details. So we thank again Tyron Picard, Emily Bakke, Hunter Hall. Uh, really appreciate our partnership with you and all the work you're doing. Um, and we really appreciate everyone for joining us today. Um, I'll let our CEO Troy say any closing remarks before we wrap up. Andre, I don't think there are any closing remarks to say. I appreciate the information. Appreciate uh, Tyron and your group. Uh, you guys do a great job, and we appreciate the partnership. And thank you all for joining us. Thanks we'll again. Send, thank you. We're going to send everyone um, the recording uh, and the materials and also uh, information on uh, how to access sort of the FAQs through the SBA and, and that sort of information. We'll email that out to everyone afterwards, and it will all be posted at oneacadiana.org slash webinars. Um, and that'll do it for us uh, for today. Thanks, everyone, and please stay safe.